we've come up with a name that I think covers all the people at the university, and so you'll hear it a lot. It's a hashtag Yukon uh, Nation. Um, and what Yukon Nation means is faculty, staff, students, alumni, parents, donors, and also people in the community throughout Connecticut and beyond who have a stake in the university, who care about the university. The university also owes to them. Um, the university owes faculty great places to do their research and the kind of support they need. Um, it owes the, the university owes the students terrific classes and professors. Um, it owes the staff, and the staff are our most important population because they're the ones who are keeping this place running day to day. Um, and they also need you know, fair compensation and, and great places to work. Um, parents invested a lot in the university. Um, they too want to be connected to, engage with the university for the long term, and certainly our alumni and our donors who have also put either their time and energy or their, um, their resources into the university. So all these parties taken together um, are what we call Yukon Nation. And uh, a goal of mine is to not only keep drawing these parties together because we share something so precious, so important, but also make sure that the people who give to us, that we give back to them um, in ways that are gratifying. So within the next 10 years, Will UConn be known as more of a STEM university or as a more well-rounded university? Oh, that's a great question because there's so much emphasis put on STEM. So the question is, uh, will we be a STEM kind of place? And I'm really glad you asked that because a lot of people see so much investment in STEM. I mean, these are big, expensive buildings, and those of you who are in the sciences know that equipment to do sophisticated scientific and engineering research is very costly. Uh, so I think there's a lot of attention to STEM, which is you know, vitally important to any research university, but because of the cost of it, it's looked at as more important because we're not pouring that same amount of money into art history and philosophy and political science and, and management. So yeah, I hope not that we, I hope we, know, I hope we are better and better known for excellent work in STEM, but also in the other fields that I mentioned, whether they're philosophy, pharmacy, sociology, uh, so I think that's where the perception imbalance comes in, but it's, it's a very fair question. I get it all the time and, um, and we need to keep working on it as we, we try to put out this balanced message about being a comprehensive research university and not a STEM place. And it's been a number of years now we've been a top 20 uh, public research institution. How important is it to get to the next level, to really be top 10 other than a matter of pride? Does it mean more resources? Would it be helpful to us. Yeah, I think it, it's important not because it's a beauty contest, you know, being in the top 10 or, or top 20, um, because it's real people and real ideas. So it, it is the case that those measures like US News and World Report, or there's a ranking of, there are many, many rankings now, there's a ranking of universities by how much federal research money they bring in. And we look at all those kind of indicators. Um, it's important to move up in those because it means that you are doing better research, um, that your students are achieving more, and that you're trying to solve those big international, social, political, economic, um, technological problems that I was talking about. So um, to move to that next level to get from, say, number 19 where we are, and that's much higher than where we are with regard to research. Uh, and so that's going to be key to um, us moving up in rankings. Uh, can we hire the faculty, which goes back to operating budget, who are the people with the ideas? Can we support them? And that means equipment, having good staff, having great students to teach, having fabulous graduate students who are collaborators with them. Um, can we do that? Because the more research money we bring in, the more productive our faculty are, that's how we get to the next level. So I'm glad that the increase in UConn's attendance was mentioned because with that increase, there's trying to be an increase in diversity on campus. So what are your plans for the future to increase that diversity and to increase multicultural awareness? Yeah, no, it's a great question. The student body as a whole has become more diverse. And so that we've been pretty good at. And you could see from the last three or four years, especially. Um, so when I got here, people, many people asked me to make speeches about diversity. 
And I have done that many times, and I thought some of them were you know, pretty darn good at many institutions around the country, because uh, uh, most struggle with this, most of the ones I've been at. And um, I do make those speeches, but I will tell you, it is the people on the ground, especially senior faculty, when it comes to recruiting faculty, and you know, staff committees and managers when it comes to hiring staff to proactively try to get minority people to UConn. So when it comes to undergraduate diversity, that is a central administration responsibility. That is responsibility of Nathan First and Wayne Locus, the people who run, and Mona um, Lucas who run uh, enrollment management, because that's a, a specialized field that go out and cover the country and the world. But when it comes to staff and when it comes to faculty, um, the central administration needs help from people who are, who are actually doing the work every day. So for the past uh, quite few years, um, undergraduate enrollment continues to uh, increase. Uh, and I was wondering, what is the long-term goal for graduate enrollment? Currently, graduate students are about a quarter of the population. You're looking to maintain that ratio, and how uh, do you propose to improve graduate student services to support the increasing population? We don't expect a big growth in the graduate student population because of the operating budget. And so we want to make sure that the graduate students we take, that we can handle them, that we, can, we have enough faculty to advise them, to teach them in the small setting, the way graduate students need to be taught, but also graduate student support. So in terms of um, the, the kind of proportion of graduate students to undergraduates, I think that'll probably stay about the same. And it's an open question, too, on how many undergraduates we can take. So that's, it is actually the number of students we take is, is one, of the, one of the few things that we really control. Um, at the university and uh, it's, it's very much budget dependent. It's also dependent on natural resources around us like water um, and space and uh, I think we're, you know, there's, there's more room to build here but we do want to stay, you know, pretty much in our current footprint and, um, you know, preserve the more rural landscape that, that draws people to New England, draws people to Connecticut. As you know, Hartford struggles with the achievement gap. So is there a way where you can connect us so that as a Yukon nation, we can really start to demonstrate how we're in the forefront in trying to address these problems? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Now, I'm not exactly sure what came before me in terms of talk about Hartford or being in Hartford, but um, I tell you, this is one of the best things we'll do, at least in my time, is bring thousands of people to Hartford every day to, you know, to build that urban vibe in that part of Hartford um, and hopefully throughout the city. To be there physically, I think, makes a lot of students in Hartford, high school students, middle school students, and they're going to be a big part of this, this program when we get everything up and running, um, to dream about going to college. That, look, at there's this college, a research university, right in your midst. It's walking distance or a short bus ride, and you could be there. And so hopefully that'll inspire a lot of the students to um, to want to be, you know, enrolled students um, at UConn. And whether they stay there for their whole degree or transfer to this campus doesn't matter. Um, but they're getting they're getting higher education. So one of the really not, I mean people love this that we're coming to Hartford as you can imagine, especially the people who um, who have devoted themselves to Hartford and its growth for their whole lives who are from here. Uh, and uh, what's really nice is to meet with, I met recently with um, small business owners right in that area we're going to, which is right near the Convention Center and the Wadsworth Museum. And uh, you can already see there are more restaurants and, and stores down there, but um, people have big ideas about the kind of services, um, buildings they want to build all around there, um, and it's because of Yukon. So that makes me really happy that we're the you know, we're driving force. Do you have like serv service learning projects for those in the community that are solving the real problem today of the achievement gap? It's actually one of our strengths in the NEAG School of Education. I'm not sure who's here from NEAG, um, but we have a lot of faculty there who work specifically on the educational achievement gap. And, and uh, we have so many um, uh, education students, undergraduates and graduate students, um, working in the Hartford schools and we have for a long time. So this is a really good example of something we do um, that is fabulous. What is UConn doing more specifically for uh, graduating seniors in terms of assisting and maybe postgraduate studies or even 
um, career placement? Mm -hmm. uh, great question. Um, one of the things that we're working on very hard, and I think it's just starting to take off, is um, connecting our alumni out there who do fabulous things, and, and several of them are, are in this room, um, who are leaders in their industry, who have been in their careers for a long time, trying to get them connected with our students who want to do those, so, those careers, so that they can get a sense of how that person started, how did they get into that field, and what should I be doing as a freshman or a sophomore to try to get myself ready to work in that field? So um, I think that, you know, when I go around the country and talk about what are our priorities, I always mention the Career Center because that study abroad, you know, getting our students out there so they become um, citizens of the world, those are among the two big undergraduate goals that are, I think, not debatable. You know, we must do those things as a 21st century uh, research university. In the years to come with the growth of Next Gen Connecticut and all the other projects you're talking about, how is tuition going to change and how is UConn going to be supportive of its students who still want to afford to come here? Yeah, well that's that's the question of the hour. <laughs> I'm glad that, you know, we're almost done. I'm glad that somebody finally asked it because it's um, it's going to get talked about a lot. It has been already um, in the president, U.S. presidential campaign. Um, the cost of college has gone up for, for many, many reasons. Um, for us, it's not, and, and a lot of it is about services. You know, our students do expect um, the campus to be wireless. Um, they expect the dorms to be nice. Um, so there are those kind of things, but there, those are really costs around the margin. Um, the big cost for us at a public research university or public university, public college, um, the reason that tuition has gone up is because state appropriations have gone down. And that is the essential challenge right here, right now, for um, all institutions like ours. So what it really comes down to for students and parents is, is the, is the price, even if it's gone up, even if we have to raise tuition because of those factors, remember, we don't want to slip out of the top 20. Because if we froze tuition for years, we kept it the same, but our state appropriations kept going down, we are falling so fast out of the top 20 that, you know, in a blink of an eye. Um, because that, uh, that operating money is what helps us to teach students well, to offer classes, to have faculty. Um, we will try to keep it low. Very important to keep our quality high, to be competitive with other universities at, of our stature. You know, we are not competing with, you know, with non-research universities, for example, um, to do all those things. But most important, and uh, this gets lost in the presidential debates and on newscasts, and I just, you know, my heart falls whenever I watch this stuff. Um, so much of this is about need. So much of this is about financial aid. So the sticker price for a university is interesting, but the truth is that a lot of universities, a lot of public universities, certainly like UConn, I believe that over half of our students are on financial aid. And these are students that need the financial aid. And so our job, if we can hold on to our operating money, um, is to have enough financial aid scholarship money for those students to attend UConn. And if the state appropriations would at just least stay the same and not be cut, then I think we can make it with not such a very big tuition increases, increase. But um, if our state appropriations go down, tuition has got to go up. Otherwise, we're going to lose everything we've built. And all the great work that you've done um, as an alum, as a donor, as faculty, students, staff, um, is going to start to falter, and the university will falter. Um, our goal here is to protect UConn, to make sure it's still accessible. Um, if, if the tuition goes up, to pay for this, we got to make sure that the students who, um, who need financial aid, who need scholarship money, get it. My question is, what is the university doing, or does it have plans to further unify those um, three campuses? You mentioned Farmington and Storrs and the law school. Um, but we also have Waterbury, Torrington, Avery Point, and Stanford. Um, and these are all campuses that matter immensely to us. And uh, we need that interchange of ideas and best practices and just sharing of resources to be successful. With, with regard to Yukon Stores and Farmington, um, the most important thing is uh, research connectivity. So our Vice President for Research, uh, he's not here, his name's Jeff Seaman. Um, has been working pretty much every day since he got here 
um, to try to make it easier for scientists at Farmington to, to work with scientists on this campus. But I do urge people to um, pay closer attention to our media. And uh, I find so many times people who are very interested in UConn are not looking on our website, don't look on our Facebook page, are not signed up for UConn today, which I think is the easiest way to stay abreast of what's going on to the university. You know, it's a free thing. You give your email and every day there's one or two really cool stories about, and this is across campuses, what students are doing at Waterbury that's really special and interesting and internationally recognized a new invention of one of our faculty in engineering, um, what we're doing with regard to service learning in, in Hartford or New Haven or Bridgeport. All those stories eventually come on UConn and so you get to see the best of the university. So if you're not signed up already, I urge you to do that. It'll give you a lot of, the, um, a lot of your arsenal um, that you need to try to be ambassadors for the university and also give you ideas of what needs to change. So, um, uh, Read whatever newspaper you like, social media, but make sure you hear our voice too, which is, I think, um, pretty beautifully displayed on, on our social media and also on our webpage. So thanks, everybody. This was great. All right, thanks. Thank you.